never wanted a regular type life. What's that? Pints of the pub and smartwatches? It's a lot of money. What are you doing? I'm talking to an empty telephone, darling. I don't understand. Because there's a dead chap on the other end of this line. Two pit. A chap inside once told me, don't become attached to anything you're not willing to say to the pit to in 30 seconds flat. If you feel the heat around the corner, and welcome to the show today we return to a watch and subject we all adore watches in movies now in order to understand why the seiko ani has become such an icon beyond its cinematic stardom and horological importance we need to delve a little deeper in doing so it has revealed some deeply fascinating things and observations that i want to share with you today the seiko ani has been in several films but it was actually Predator that took it to a more profound level, with Arnold Schwarzenegger as Dutch Schaefer, a soldier of fortune hired by the US government to secretly rescue a group of politicians trapped in a guerrilla-held territory located in a Central American rainforest. Let's analyze and find out how, why, and what made this stand out from all the other testosterone-fueled, muscle-filled, quintessential action movies featuring this revolutionary Seiko. Now, before we get into it, please don't forget to like this video if you want to see more independent, free content like this, and also a wristwatch check. During the making of this video, I wore predominantly my Rolex Explorer on the Melange strap from Risk Candy Watch Club, as well as my Rolex GMT on the classic Jubilee. There's no denying that the Seiko H558, featured in many career-defining movies of Arnold Schwarzenegger, was his own watch. As we have established in earlier videos and by his own admission, he's a big watch collector. In the very start of the 1970s, he purchased his first Rolex, being pictured with the now equally iconic GMT Master in 1971. More on that later. Most likely, this luxury watch was purchased to celebrate his movie debut in the absurdly comical and so bad it's good Hercules in New York in 1970. Now, he's on his way to the Big Apple. <coughs> Take in the sights. I don't have any money. Run, hey! How you you dare you Also, there were many bodybuilding competition wins around this time, like Mr. Universe, Mr. Olympia, and so on. So my guess is to celebrate, as well as his move from Austria to the United States in October 1968, at the age of 21, in order to follow his dreams. So why did he choose to wear the Seiko and not the Rolex? To understand why, we need to understand the watch market of the late 1970s and 80s. Digital and quartz watches were very much the smart watches of that era, following the quartz crisis, of course. You are witnessing the creation of a new excellence in time. Seiko LaSalle. Traditional mechanical Swiss watches were not so much in vogue anymore. Digital and quartz watches were favoured by the trendy, the young, the fashionable, and even those affluent enough who could afford any luxury watch. They actually preferred the latest cutting-edge tech. This was before the Swiss had figured out that aspirational marketing was the only way to survive, as we saw so perfectly personified by the Patrick Batemans, Gordon Geckos, and Glen Gary Glen Rosses of this world, who very much bought into it. You see this watch? Yeah. That watch costs more than your car. 
I made $970,000 last year. How much you make? You see, pal, that's who I am, and you're nothing. The H558 not only was superior to anything the Swiss could offer at a fraction of the price, it was a world first. Initially introduced in 1982, it was one of the first analog and digital dive watches, or Annie Digi for short. It was the first to offer a digital alarm, chronograph, day and date, calendar complications, all combined in a 150 meter capable diving watch. Based on the equally iconic tuna shrouded case design, another world changing saturation diver we've also discussed, its dial and handset was classic Seiko diver highly legible in an easy to distinguish layout, and then combined with the latest quartz digital technology, making it super accurate, affordable, rugged, and highly functional. Aesthetically, it was still very 70s in its design, reminiscent of brutalist architecture and ultra utilitarianism that ultimately gave it a very aggressive, bold, masculine, and sci-fi look, perfect for Predator. This was, of course, before the later domination of G-Shock watches. In fact, in many ways, the Arnie is still even more functional than your typical G-Shock Square from a few years later. With the inclusion of the unidirectional bezel and the digital complications, you can time multiple things at the same time. Extremely nifty for a man on many missions, and especially in a military context, where timing is absolutely crucial. Seiko even tested it in a range of extreme temperatures. It even went to summit Everest and survived visits to both North and the South Pole. So naturally it was a hot watch to have for any cinematic tough guy, perfectly illustrated in the gun and gear porn preparation montages of both movies that preceded Predator, Raw Deal and Commando. But Predator went one step further, thus becoming, in my opinion, the pinnacle of this Seiko tough guy era. Firstly, it subverted the preparing for war montage, which by now had become something of a movie cliche. It achieved this by having it contrasted by low-tech weapons, like setting traps, primitive bow and arrows, all the while Arnie's still wearing the Seiko. Predator also was simply a much better film a multi-layered action capolavoro by director John McTiernan, who would go on to make another masterpiece, Die Hard, only a year later. While some may dismiss Predator as simply another big, dumb, macho 80s monster movie, at its core it's a survival story that combines an extremely effective, slow revelation of the now classic Stan Winston-designed creature, along with masterful and inventive filmmaking. Only Dutch survives against the creature, the ultimate example of the individualist leader and Darwinian survival of the fittest. Despite the Zarathustrian Ubermensch undertones, the fact that Arnold is Austrian in real life makes me wonder, is it coincidental or just darkly humorous irony? Maybe the name Dutch was a deliberate ploy to throw off the obvious racist connotations with Nazi Aryan ideology. It does also help to explain his lovably non-American distinct accent, an excuse that his later films would dispense with and could not even be bothered with. Remember Jingle All The Way? Nice doggy. Nice! The Dutch, after all, as a people, are renowned for being the tallest in the world. So, Dutch survives due to his superior size over his team members, fitter overall strength, intellectual abilities and fighting prowess, allowing him to finally outwit and ultimately defeat an opponent even more technologically advanced and even larger in size. We are of course talking about the predator creature itself. Interestingly, it is only until his less capable team members are all killed off one by one that Dutch can finally put up a better fight, further underlining his supremacy. Like the Terminator, Raw Deal and Commando, Arnold fills the movie poster for the marketing campaign. The movie wastes no time at all, opening with the prioritization of Dutch over his peers, 
looking cool, smoking cigars, with some cool sunglasses on, and even a bright red polo shirt to really make him stand out. All the while, the music emphasizes his presence with that exquisitely bombastic military score by Alan Silvestri. There's no shadow of a doubt that the team is secondary, so naturally this coolness and strength permeates onto the watch. The movie makes his physical and intellectual dominance over his subordinates abundantly clear. Only ever being challenged by ranking superior, Dylan, played excellently by Carl Weathers. The only other character who has a physical build of Apollonian quality to rival Dutch. During the famous arm wrestling greeting scene, Dutch's bulging bicep, a blatant reminder of his superiority over Dylan. The CIA got you pushing too many pencils? Huh? Even today, in our so-called civil society, competitiveness between males, subconsciously or not, always has this underlying presence and has formed the basis of mankind's hierarchical social structure since the beginning of time. Seiko could not have asked for better promotion. Buy the Arnie watch and you can be just as strong and always get to the chopper on time. The action movies of Arnold in particular underline and glorify the idea of muscle-bound superiority beyond all other action stars of this age. Sylvester Stallone's Rambo, for example, was always more emotional. Jean-Claude Van Damme's characters tended to be more preoccupied with love interests. And there are countless examples, please do share yours in the comments. But they all shared common traits too. The enemy constantly missing and firing, unable ever to be accurate most often smaller in stature, while in contrast, our hero is always able to mow down endless hordes with a single arm. The irony is, in real life, the increased body mass would be easier to hit, and muscle strength means nothing to real bullets or in more stealthy jungle warfare, where agility is king. Just look at the Vietnam War, for example. Again, Predator goes one better than the previous Seiko Arnie movies. While Commando had the modded out Seiko as a plot device, in Predator, after Dutch finally defeats the creature, it activates its own self-destruct device via a wrist-worn computer. Could this be a prescient foreboding comment on technology? Even a deeply meta commentary on the demise of traditional watches by more advanced tech? And how ultimately all technology at some point becomes disposable? A very interesting coincidence, don't you think? The jungle heat and the resulting sweaty look accentuates the muscle definition, as if they had all just been working out. In fact, I think they were. According to the behind the scenes documentaries, it was a very competitive environment on the shoot. But that aside, it's a perfect setting for a dive capable water resistant watch. The humidity in the jungle alone almost demands it. The movie's characters also wielded much larger weaponry than their human adversaries. The most obvious example being the character Blaine with the minigun, played so memorably and quotably by former military veteran and pro wrestler Jesse Ventura. While the enemy have the standard Cold War era go-to weapon for any self-respecting bad guy, the AK-47. The goodies on the other hand have grenade launchers and most notably in Commando, a bazooka too. At a simplistic level, the gun pawn is a symbolic reminder of male virility, power and strength. This is a very crucial characteristic of 80s and 90s action movies. On a more profound level, the technological dominance over their human enemies is representative of American military might and being a superpower. So naturally, the most advanced watch of the age must be worn, and Seiko was indeed, and undeniably so, king during that time. Maybe someday all watches will be slim and incredibly accurate, like the new Seiko ultra-thin digital quartz for men and women. Today they're made by Seiko. Maybe someday all watches will be made this way. Available at Corbo Jewelry. Isn't it enough since Hercules wrote New Chariot? He has been immortalized. I've been who? Hercules in New York. Well-defined muscle mass as a show of warrior-like fighting strength is nothing new. Just look at any Greco-Roman statue and you'll immediately see what I mean. Cinematically, it started in the 1970s. With the exaggerated nature of the 80s, it inevitably got turned up to 11. 
Prior to this time, the hero was always more typically depicted in a traditional Bondian fashion, with suaveness, intellect, classy refinement, and classic handsomeness. Bond. James Bond. More fitting for the old world Swiss made charms of Rolex, Amiga, and so on. It's no accident that in Raw Deal, when Arnie's character gets suited and booted, and in more dapper attire as a hired thug for the wise guys he has to serve, if you're the best there is, the wheel would have never been invented. He switches back to his Rolex two tone GMT. But when it's scumbag whacking time, back on the wrist is the same. <laughs> In 2019, Seika reissued the Arnie with this SNJ025. Since then, many other exciting and fun, colourful variations followed, all with an extremely similar style, in the same big scale that was very much ahead of its time when it first came out in the 80s, and the faithful, inimitable combination of key functions. They were pleasingly and logically upgraded with a solar-powered newer H851 calibre, a higher 200 meter ISO capable depth rating, along with a fully automatic calendar, accurate to the year 2100, alarm, power saving function, and a vastly improved LED backlight. While the good old days of being able to buy an SKX automatic professional diver affordably are sadly long gone, the Seiko Arnie reissues are in my opinion, the best option to go for. The most iconic, fun, historically important, true capable dive watches. So while there never was a true heir to the SKX throne, in my opinion the Seiko Arnie is the best deal to get under $500. It's not pure class, but more pure kick-ass class. Okay guys, so there we go. Now I'd quickly like to thank Mark at Long Island Watch for so graciously lending this watch in to allow me to get reacquainted with the Seiko Arnie. Of course you guys know I used to own the original, which undoubtedly I, I regret selling, but there we go. Story for another day. Uh, don't forget to add your likes, comments, thoughts, opinions, which is your favorite version of the new Arnie. What do you think of the Arnie? Strength, weaknesses, negatives, positives, all the rest of it down below. Thank you so much for watching and I will catch you in the next one. Ciao.